Advice from a Caterpillar. The caterpillar and Alice looked at each other for some time in silence. At last, the caterpillar took the hookah out of its mouth and addressed her in a languid, sleepy voice. Who are you? said the caterpillar. This was not an encouraging, an encouraging opening for a conversation. Alice reply, replied rather shyly, I, I hardly know, sir. Just at present, at least, I know who I was when I got up this morning, but I think I must have been changed several times since then. What do you mean by that, the caterpillar, said the caterpillar sternly. Explain yourself. I can't explain myself, I'm afraid, sir, said Alice, because I'm not myself, you see. I don't see, said the caterpillar. I'm afraid I can't put it more clearly, Alice replied very politely, for I can't understand it myself. To begin with, and being so many different sizes in a day, is very confusing. It isn't, said the caterpillar. Well, perhaps you haven't found it so yet, said Alice. But when you have to turn into a chrysalis, you will some day, you know. And then after that into a butterfly, I should think you'll feel a little queer, won't you? Not a bit, said the caterpillar. Well, perhaps your feelings may be different, said Alice. All I know is it would feel very queer to me. See, Alice needs a little of your confidence, Sage. You, you feel very confident in yourself. Alice is kind of having a wishy-washy day. You, said the caterpillar contemptuously, who are you? Which brought them back again to the beginning of the conversation. Alice felt a little irritated at the caterpillars making such very short remarks, and she drew herself up and said very gravely, I think you ought to tell me who you are first. Why, said the caterpillar. Here was another puzzling question, and as Alice could not think of any good reason, and the caterpillar seemed to be in a very unpleasant state of mind, she turned away. Come back, said the caterpillar after her. I've something important to say. This sounded promising, certainly. Alice turned and came back again. Keep your temper, said the caterpillar. Is that all, said Alice, swallowing down her anger as well as she could. No, said the caterpillar. Alice thought she might as well wait, as she had nothing else to do, and perhaps after all it might tell her something worth hearing. For some minutes it puffed away without speaking, but at last it unfolded its arms, took the hookah out of its mouth again, and said, So you think you're changed, do you? I'm afraid I am, sir, said Alice. I can't remember things as I used, and I don't keep the same size for ten minutes together. Can't remember what things, said the caterpillar. Well, I've tried to say, how doth the little busy bee? But it all comes different, Alice replied in a very melancholy voice. Repeat, you are old Father William, said the caterpillar. Alice folded her hands and began. You are old Father William, the young man said, and your hair has become very white. And yet you incessantly stand on your head, do you think at your age it is right? In my youth, Father William replied to his son, I feared it might injure the brain. But now that I'm perfectly sure I have none, why I do it again and again. You are old, said the youth, as I mentioned before, and have grown most uncommonly fat. Yet you turned a back somersault in at the door. Pray, what is the reason for that? In my youth, said the sage, as he shook his gray locks, I kept all my limbs very supple. By the use of this ointment when shilling the box, allow me to sell you a couple. <laughs> I'm in. Sell me that. You are old, said the youth, and your jaws are too weak for anything tougher than suet. Yet you finished the goose with the bones in the beak. Pray, how did you manage to do it? In my youth, said his father, I took to the law and argued each case with my wife, and the muscular strength which it gave to my jaw has lasted the rest of my life. <laughs> you are old, said the youth. One would hardly suppose that your eye was as steady as ever. Yet you balanced an eel on the end of your nose. What made you so awfully clever? I have answered three questions, and that is enough, said his father. Don't give me your airs. 
Do you think I can listen all day to such stuff? Be off or I'll kick you downstairs. Oh, bye, Mr. Incredible. Thank you for stopping by. It's always this exciting, so you're welcome anytime. I haven't really figured out a good schedule yet, but hopefully I'll, I'll get it down eventually. But thank you so much. I hope you have a good night. That's not quite right, said the caterpillar. Not quite right, I'm afraid, said Alice timidly. Some of the words have got altered. It is wrong from beginning to end, said the caterpillar, decidedly, and there was silence for some minutes. The caterpillar was the first to speak. What size do you want to be, it asked. Oh, I'm not particular as to size, Alice hastily replied. Only one doesn't like changing so often, you know. <laughs> Thank you. It's, they do a lot of rhyming couplets. It makes it a little easier to get the meter right. Um, I don't know, said the caterpillar. Alice said nothing. She had never been so contradicted in her life before, and she felt that she was losing her temper. Are you contented now, said the caterpillar. Well, I should like to be a little larger, sir, if you wouldn't mind, said Alice. Three inches is such a wretched height to be. It is a very good height indeed, said the caterpillar angrily, rearing itself upright as it spoke. It was exactly three inches high. But I'm not used to it, pleaded poor Alice in a piteous tone, and she thought to herself, I wish the creatures wouldn't be so easily offended. You'll get used to it in time, said the caterpillar, and put the hookah into its mouth and began smoking again. This time Alice waited patiently until it chose to speak again. In a minute or two, the caterpillar took the hookah out of its mouth and yawned once or twice and shook itself. Then it got down off the mushroom and crawled away into the grass, merely remarking as it went, One side will make you grow taller, and the other side will make you grow shorter. One side of what? The other side of what? thought Alice to herself. Of the mushrooms, said the caterpillar, just as if she had asked it aloud, and in another moment it was out of sight. Alice remained looking thoughtfully at the mushroom for a minute trying to make out which were the two sides of it, and as it was perfectly round, she found this a very difficult question. However, at last she stretched her arms round, um, stretched her arms round it as far as they would go, and broke off a bit of the edge with each hand. And now which is which, she said to herself, and nibbled a little of the right hand bit to try the effect. The next moment she felt a violent blow underneath her chin. It had struck her foot, she was a good deal frightened by this very sudden change, but she felt that there was no time to be lost, as she was shrinking rapidly. So she set to work at once to eat some of the other bit. Her chin was pressed so closely against her toe that there was hardly room to open her mouth, but she did it at last and managed to swallow a morsel of the left-hand bit. It's a Jefferson Airplane song that has that line, um... One pill makes you larger, and one pill makes you small. And the one that mother gives you doesn't do anything at all. Pretty sure it was Jefferson Airplane. Or they might, uh, were they Jefferson Starship by then? Any 1960s music aficionados out there want to correct me or help me? Always welcome help. <laughs> all that I can get, really. Oh, we can finish this. Come, my head's free at last, said Alice in a tone of delight, which changed into alarm in another moment when she found that her shoulders were nowhere to be found. All she could see when she looked down was an immense length of neck, which seemed to rise like a stalk out of a sea of green leaves that lay far below her. Oh, I love Robinson's Greyhound. You remember what was their big hit, Stevie? I can't even think of a pun for an old song. <laughs> what do you think? What's their what's their classic hit? Don't miss me at the bus stop. Oh, with that really good bass rift. You see, you can't slap at the bass when your arms are this long because it just points out how weird and long your arms are. Oh, it's so great. Rift. Did I have a silent T? Rift. Did I say... 
Is this is a gift gif thing? Should I add that to my um, divisive comments? Toilet paper roll up or down? Gif or gif? Things that I'm mostly uh, indifferent to that rile people up so badly. Fun. What can all that green stuff be, said Alice? And where have my shoulders got to? And oh, my poor hands, how is it I can't see you? She was moving them about as she spoke, but no result seemed to follow, except a little shaking among the distant green leaves. As there seemed to be no chance of getting her hands up to her head, she tried to get her head down to them, and was delighted to find that her neck would bend about easily in any direction like a serpent. She had just succeeded in curving it down into a graceful zigzag and was going to dive in among the leaves, which she found to be nothing but the tops of the trees under which she had been wandering, when a sharp hiss made her draw back in a, in a hurry. A large pigeon had flown into her face and was beating her violently with its wings. Oh, were you really? I can't tell if it's a joke or not, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> oh i could kind of see that i feel like um you always heard jokes about like the like the pink Flo pink floyd laser show led zeppelin's probably in that era jefferson airplane definitely would have been um that i could see that I guess it's hard that that era had like all of those. Hi, Kevin. Oh, <laughs> this is the dress I wore to that last wedding. The only difference is I added, um, I added pedophores to make it even more tea party appropriate. So I'm extra floofy today. Um, but yeah, that generation of music was either like people tripping out on acid and, and vibing or like these really great songwriters that were very folksy. Um, I love both, so it doesn't really matter. Folksy or acid rock, I'm all in. Oh, that was one of my favorite books for a while. It was, um, it's Tom Wolfe, who will not be in the public domain for a very long time. Oh, <laughs> stupid Bobby. Um, I think there's such broad categories. You're looking at like decades and like maybe the habits of the listeners more than the actual style of the music. I know, right? Um, but, oh yeah, so the book was called The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test. And it was, um, this, this was a West Coast thing. It was Ken Kesey with a bunch of other like weird hippies who are living who are living and traveling around in the van that they called further this is a very big thing like you see it referenced in a lot of a lot of that era's like pop culture and they were traveling around and doing acid and going to grateful dead shows and just like just vi vibing out like the <laughs> the old version of vibing out but it's so funny to, um, I read a lot of books from the people that they reference in there. Um, Kerouac wasn't one. He was an East Coast guy. He was, he was fun too. But like Ken Kesey is a great writer. He's um, famous for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which people probably know more for the, um, the Jack Nicholson movie. But it's a really interesting book. Um, there's like, a, and there's like Doors of Perception, which won't be in the public domain. But there is another Aldous Huxley book that is. So if we get like, if there's a group of people who want some, some Huxley, I'm totally in. <laughs> and then in 50 years, if I'm, if Twitch is still a thing, I'll read all the beatnik literature that I love so much, bro. <laughs> Orange shoes. Hi. Hi. Hi, Chris. How are you? Bro. Huxley. Yeah, right. <laughs> Does Elena know you pick on me this much? I know this is um his Stevie's wife and I are both very bookish and we do this anytime we're together and Steve is just as cutting in person. <laughs> I know. So there's like there's like Orwellian people and Huxley people. 
Orwell's greatest fear was that the world would watch us. And there are definitely people that fear that the most. And Huxley, Huxley feared a world where we're too distracted to care. And I think that's a little more realistic. Mm-hmm. They, yeah. Isn't it crazy? Did you ever read the electric Kool-Aid acid test, Tom Wolfe's novel, Chris? It's <laughs> Huxwellian. Huxwellian, they're the frigid. That's just people with anxiety and paranoia. Doesn't matter what you're scared of. Um, oh, I picked up a copy at a library where they're trying to sell off the stuff that they couldn't loan out anymore. So my copy is this very, oh, it's somewhere in here. Oh, it's right behind my head. It's like one of those old hardcover ones where they, they like glue the paperback one in there. Oh gosh. It doesn't have, it doesn't have a library card in it. It has one I made for myself when I thought I could catalog all my books, like the coolest person. Huxley has been super right. Hi, Baron. Um, yes, I fear Huxley's future more than Orwell's. A hundred percent. Um, oh my God. Can you imagine if Huxley could see what we all looked like with phones in our hands? He'd, he'd weep. <laughs> But yeah, if you ever need, Chris, next time you're up in this area, I have a copy um, that I got from the library. Oh, it does still have the original library card in it. <laughs> he would absolutely lose it. Oh, man. But yeah, everyone's so worried about microchipping and Big Brother. Oh, silly. So silly. <laughs> Oh, Baron, how did you find me? Are you from the Discord too? Oh, well, thank you for being here either way. It's nice to meet you. We are slugging our way through Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, the second book I've read on stream. We're about halfway through, a little less than. Uh, which this book's going to go super fast. So we'll have to start putting together um, the poll again to see what to read next. Everything I read is in the public domain too. So if you have any suggestions or something you really love, I'm open to anything. As long as it's not, um, there are some ugly things written long, long ago. Oh, I'll have to look at that. Is that the, um, the, like, the epic poem he wrote, like Jabberwocky? I had a friend who had memorized a portion of that poem. Yeah. I should memor I've memorized worse. I should memorize that. I'll it's my homework next week. I'll do it with my eyes closed so you know I'm not cheating. <laughs> All right, let's see. All right, I'm going to try and get through this chapter and then I'll take a little break and chat more too. Serpent screamed the pigeon. I'm not a serpent, said Alice indignantly. Let me alone. Serpent, I say again, repeated the pigeon, but in a more subdued tone and added with a kind of sob, I've tried every way and nothing seems to suit them. I haven't the least idea what you're talking about, said Alice. I've tried the roots of trees and I've tried banks and I've tried hedges, the pigeon went on without attending to her, but those serpents, there's no pleasing them. Alice was more and more puzzled. But she thought there was no use in saying anything more till the pigeon had finished. As if it wasn't trouble enough hatching the eggs, said the pigeon. But I must be on the lookout for serpents night and day. Why, I haven't had a wink of sleep these three weeks. I'm very sorry you've been annoyed, said Alice, who was beginning to see its meaning. And just as I'd taken the highest tree in the wood, continued the pigeon, raised its voice to a shriek, and just as I was thinking I would be free of them at last, they must needs come wriggling down from the sky. Ah, oh, serpent! But I'm not a serpent, I tell you, said Alice. I'm a... I'm a... Well, what are you, said the pigeon. I can see you're trying to invent something. I'm a little girl, said Alice, rather doubtfully, as she remembered the number of changes she had gone through that day likely story indeed said the pigeon in a tone of the deepest contempt <clears throat> i've seen a good many little girls in my time but never one with such a neck as that 
No, no, you're a serpent, and there's no use denying it. I suppose you'll be telling me next that you've never tasted an egg. I have certainly tasted eggs, certainly, said Alice, who was, very truth who was a very truthful child. But little girls eat eggs quite as much as serpents do, you know. I don't believe it, said the pigeon. But if they do, why then they're a kind of serpent. That's all I can say. There was such a new idea to Alice that she was quite silent for a minute or two which gave the pigeon the opportunity of adding, You're looking for eggs, I know that well enough, and what does it matter to me whether you're a little girl or a serpent? It matters a good deal to me, said Alice hastily, but I'm not looking for eggs, as it happens, and if I was, I shouldn't want yours. I don't like them raw. Well, be off, then, said the pigeon in a sulky tone, as it settled down again into its nest. Alice crouched down among the trees as well as she could, for her neck kept getting tangled among the branches, and every now and then she had to stop and untwist it. After a while she remembered that she still held the pieces of mushroom in her hands, and she set to work very carefully, nibbling first at one and then at the other, and growing sometimes taller and sometimes shorter, until she had succeeded in bringing herself down to her usual height. It was so long since she had been anything near the right size that it felt quite strange at first, but she got used to it in a few minutes and began talking to herself as usual. Come, there's half of my plan done now. How puzzling all these changes are. I'm never sure what I'm going to be from one minute to another. However, I've got to get my right size. And, um, oh, the next thing is to get into that beautiful garden. How is that to be done, I wonder? As she said this, she came suddenly upon an open place, with a little house in it about four feet high. Whoever lives there, thought Alice, it'll never do to come upon them this size. Why, I should frighten them out of their wits. So she began nibbling at the right-hand bit again, and did not venture to go near the house until she had brought herself down to nine inches high. 